On this episode of True North, we follow Mark, a local newspaper editor, to get the scoop on Long Yearbin. So this used to be my apartment. Essentially, it's sinking into the ground due to softening permafrost underneath the building. And the shocking impact of climate change that's leaving its residents out in the cold. We're going through something entirely new here. Climate change is causing storms to happen in whole new ways. Now that we had a clear picture of the town's history, we wanted to get an insider's perspective on the current state of Long Yearbin. So we met up with the editor of the island's alternative newspaper. Howdy, welcome to my corporate headquarters. <laughs> my name is Mark Sabatini. I edit a weekly newspaper in English called Ice People. So these are the first copies. I have to do everything, obviously, by hand, from uh, the writing to uh, the printing to the assembling to the distribution. It's pretty much all me. There is no typical week. There is no typical thing I report about. Up here after nine years, the news has been changing as much as the community has been during that time, from science to politics to whatever crazy things are happening among the visitors and explorers and expeditioners who come up here. Living in one of the most remote places in the world does have its quirks. There are no roads between the island's more remote settlements, no social services, and limited infrastructure. You can't be born or die here. The hospital here theoretically can deliver a baby, and they have in emergencies, but they're not equipped to handle complications. There are a number of rules like that. It's, it's very open, but if you come here, you accept that there's also some very strict rules you have to observe, and those are for practical reasons. And the stories that come from this place are equally unusual. People say, how in the world can you just live in this small town isolated from everything and not just go out of your mind? And I see more newsworthy stuff happening here and less chance of ever being bored than I ever could imagine in almost any large city. It's so different than every place else. This was one of the first uh, sources that I went to for information. Believe it or not, there's plenty of news for two newspapers in this tiny town of 2000. I can see that. Did you know much about the history before you came here? I didn't know anything about Svalbard. I was traveling the world writing about jazz. I've been to like 60 or 70 countries, and I saw something called Polar Jazz. The world's northernmost jazz festival, happening at the end of January. Who in their right mind is going to come to this? <laughs> I was immediately hooked when I came up here and saw this place. This was a chance to do something, certainly, that nobody else was doing. I love it. Because of the Svalbard Treaty, Longyearbyen is one of the only places in the world that doesn't require a visa or passport to live or work there. So if you're from one of these countries that's a signatory, you can just come up here and make a life from scratch. Sure, anybody can come here and uh, start a business and become a resident. Uh, you have to be self-sufficient, because getting housing on your own is extremely difficult, even more so now, because we've lost more than 100 homes ever since we had an avalanche a year and a half ago. So we have a real housing crunch here. What's the front page story? Top story is six guys who are paddling across the Atlantic Ocean from uh, Longyearbyen to uh, Greenland. We get a lot of adventurers up here. <coughs> People doing crazy things? Uh, well, brave and or crazy. <laughs> what else? Something that happens during the summer is there's a lot of cleanup efforts. One of those is like a trash lottery. You get hundreds and hundreds of residents who enter this thing. And the 24 lucky people you get to go up on the governor's big service ship and pick up trash for five days. <laughs> I love that the locals enter a lottery to be able to pick up trash and clean up their, you know, their island, their well, home. Well, the thing is, is Svalbard has, uh, it, it's promoted as the pristine crown jewel of Norway, and to be honest, that's a little bit of a myth. The population of Longyearbyen has conflicting values when it comes to their environmental impact. Well, the first thing a lot of folks here see is all the relics of coal mining, which is what this town was built on. And not only is mining something a lot of people want to see continue, 
despite all the uh, calls for action on climate change, but we still burn coal for electricity. Uh, we discharge raw sewage into the bay, which is great if you want to go bird watching or there's a reason all the birds are out there. Longyearbyen is both a town with an unusually large environmental impact, with the highest CO2 output in the world per capita, and one of the places experiencing the most extreme impacts of climate change. And Mark is quick to point out this paradox. All I see everywhere is snowmobiles parked up like on the side of a building and on the side of a hill. They seem to be everywhere. Yeah, we've got a couple thousand of these things scattered all over town and we keep adding more of them. With the increasing need for tourism, we need more and more of these to take uh, folks out on tours with. That, of course, uh, contributes to uh, the whole environmental paradox up here. There's a push uh, for more ecotourism, more dog sledding, uh, stuff that isn't as noisy and doesn't disrupt the wildlife as much. But in a lot of ways, these are a necessity during winter for a lot of folks. They're really the most practical way to get to a lot of places. And the increase in tourism also raises questions about the scalability of the island's limited infrastructure. Is this like the main strip? Uh, it's the main pedestrian road. Does it ever actually get busy? Oh God, yes. When we get a big cruise ship in, this thing is just packed. It looks like Disneyland. In the bigger picture, however, Svalbard contributes less than half of 1% of the world's pollution. Yet it's feeling more than its share of the effects of climate change. So what are we looking at here? Well, this was used as a hospital for a few decades, and then about 20 years ago, they converted it into apartments. And about 30 of us lived here until uh, February of 2016. We were all forced to evict the building due to damage that uh, it sustained from softening permafrost underneath the building. Permafrost means the ground in Longyearbyen remains frozen year round, but that's changing quickly. So this right here, this corner used to be my apartment. These cracks started appearing a few years ago, and that's when obviously we knew there was something seriously wrong with the building, and the inside doesn't look real good either. I have a lot of cracks in my walls, bulges. There were problems with doors and windows that wouldn't close properly. So the whole place we, just started to the whole to place land. just, yeah, essentially it's sinking into the ground. We had uh, some surveyors look at the uh, building and they found more cracks in the foundation and a bunch of other damage. And their assessment was theoretically this building could collapse at any time. In uh, February of 2016, about four in the afternoon, I got a call telling me that I had two hours to get all my stuff out of my apartment, period, because the city had decided we can no longer live here. Once they saw the report, uh, they were liable for us at that point. And so we had to grab our stuff, uh, get out of there in those two hours. And all of us who had bought our apartments, we lost everything. There was no compensation, which just put some of us, including me, uh, either in or very close to bankruptcy. While Longyearbyen seems remote, permafrost melt will affect more than 4 million people who live in Arctic regions. There are some other buildings beginning to see some signs of damage as the ground continues to soften. There are a number of buildings roughly this old that are not built on stilts like a lot of uh, the buildings around town are. On a personal level, the hardest thing is it's very expensive here and I no longer have any money because I lost my home. So just trying to make it month to month and come up with enough money in one of the most expensive places to live in the world is not easy, obviously. Very few people ever became rich becoming journalists, especially on newspapers. While permafrost melt threatens the very bedrock of Longyearbyen, changes to the snow conditions have been rapid and deadly. So this is the mountain where the uh, two major avalanches were triggered from. Behind this row, uh, there were two more rows of identical houses that got hit by an avalanche back in December of 2015. It was right before Christmas, late in the morning. A lot of folks were just relaxing, enjoying holiday meals. It was a very quiet avalanche. They didn't hear it coming. And so this giant wall of snow, about four meters high, smashed into these homes and pushed them about 80 meters down the hill. Absolutely destroyed the homes themselves. There was no hope of salvaging them, and it buried nine people. Most of them that got out, some in uh, some fairly miraculous rescues. Two people, unfortunately, were killed. One was a 42-year-old teacher. The other was a two-year-old girl 
who along with their three-year-old sister were buried for an hour or two. They uh, got her out and got her to the hospital in Tromso uh, quickly, but a day later the uh, young girl died. Climate models predicted an avalanche in this area as a one in 100 year event. But when two deadly slides hit the town in a two year period, residents and officials were left without a clear sense of what would come next. The destruction had such a major psychological impact on so many people here. A lot of folks uh, who were in those homes who no longer feel safe uh, with the idea of moving back into them. A lot of it has to do with uh, the fact that we put in a warning system after that first avalanche, but that failed when uh, officials uh, used that warning system during a storm uh, in February two years later and decided, no, we don't need to empty these homes out because there's not enough snow to trigger an avalanche. But then avalanche was triggered hours after that. Huh. And that really shook their faith in what they could trust and not trust. Even the officials found that what they thought was true, they couldn't necessarily rely upon anymore. Huh. Climate change is causing storms to happen in whole new ways. We're getting more extreme storms more often from wind patterns and directions that we haven't seen before. The properties of the snow aren't the same as they used to be. And so you can't rely on historic data and patterns to determine the risk of a snow slide anymore. You have to build a new model. Resident scientists sprang to work gathering data to build new climate models, and engineers and officials are considering different proposals to protect the town. But what is for certain is that climate change in the Arctic is happening quickly. And since 25% of the northern hemisphere is covered in permafrost, there's more change to come. There are some parts of the world that say, we have our doubts about man-made climate change. We don't want to be doing what-if forecasting. We should just be basing it on historic patterns where temperatures fluctuate. And this is a perfect example of, no, you can't do that anymore. This is not part of what has been a normal cycle throughout history. We're going through something entirely new here. Climate change is happening twice as fast in the Arctic as anywhere else. And that means folks who want to learn from us can get a head start by coming up here and taking a look at things like this. Some of our tragedies and some of our uh, negative happenings have something to offer others if they want it. It's constantly changing and what uh, is important to this town is changing. Before it was what happens with mining, is it stay open or shut? Well now it's shut, so now what replaces mining? That's the next debate. Where do people live? Uh, housing is now a concern. After this, uh, it'll be something else, but I can't really say what it is. It's been incredibly unpredictable, and that's, I guess, what makes it such a great place to run a newspaper. Seeing the impact of climate change on the Arctic firsthand takes your breath away. Arctic amplification, it sounds like this dry scientific term, but what it means is when you're up there, every single person and living thing up there is feeling the impact of this more than you could ever know. Nielsen is the northernmost settlement in the world, a remote scientific village that's home to between 20 and 130 scientists at any given time, here to study parts of the Arctic free from human impact. There's definitely some special rules for this place. Immediately you see, like, turn off your Wi-Fi, turn off your Bluetooth, because they're constantly taking measurements of signals and data all around here, and they don't want anyone interfering with it. So I have to go to a tiny terminal at the port, find some sort of ethernet cable converter, and somehow get in touch with the scientist that we're supposed to speak to, because I have no idea if he's here. Apparently the planes haven't been landing since Monday, so I'm hoping our scientist is on here, but there's no way to get in touch with anybody short of going around and knocking on doors. Oh, wait. No. Since Nialazan is a private settlement open only to scientists, it operates more like a college campus than a town. There's one store open for two hours a week and one cafeteria where food is served at set times each day. Everything on the island is facilitated by Kings Bay, a former Norwegian mining company turned support team for the scientists, who manage everything from facilities to food to flights. We figured a Kings Bay rep could help us find our way around. I'm Susanne Vasahagen. I'm the advisor for Kings Bay. Nielsen is a city with a great port 
where there were no ice during the summer period and that was great for mining activities. Where was the mining? The mines are up in this area behind there. Mining activity in Kings Bay started in 1916. The mast you see over there, it's from the polar expeditions from here to the North Pole. They were led by Roald Amundsen who is a famous Norwegian explorer. They came with an airship named Norway. They had to hang in the mast over there ah, with the okay. ship and then climb up and down. It's basically a ladder. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, a big ladder. <laughs> a big, big ladder into the sky. They flew from New Olesund across the North Pole and landed in Alaska, 1928, when Umberto Nobile came with an airship named Italia. It crashed, actually, Roald Amundsen. He wanted to be part of the rescue organization, so he took a plane on the way between Tromsø and Olsen. The plane crashed and he disappeared. Until today, no one knows what happened. No one has found the plane, the remains, wow. anything. It's a lot of history bound up in a mast. We like the mast and we like the history. We heard if you go beyond Yellow River Camp, yeah. bring a gun. Yeah, I need a gun. <laughs> the only thing inside town is that all doors are yeah. open. So if there are a polar bear, there's always a house nearby. We can go inside yeah. and hide and call the watchman. The tundra is vulnerable. We have a bird sanctuary. And also there are instrument areas for scientific measuring that aren't that easy to see. Someone has driving a car here yeah. 30 years ago and there are still marks. I mean, this is an amazing view. Now that we knew our way around, I went searching for our first scientist. This is the French and German research station, so I'm just going to check and see if our guys are in here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> My name is Piotr Kupiszewski. I'm working as the station leader here at the joint German-French Avipev station. I'm working here with two engineers running the base, providing support for the scientists that come to do their research here. So there's a core of uh, inhabitants that stay here year round and this core is very integrated. And then there are also quite a few different social events. Everybody's invited to participate. That helps to bring everybody together. Lots of different people that you can talk to. And we see one another in the canteen every day for the common meals. So there's quite some interaction between the groups. There are about 10 countries with bases here. There's a Chinese station, Korean, Indian, German, French, British, Dutch. It makes for a pretty multicultural uh, environment, even though it's such a small village. The studies conducted in Nialazund are as varied as the countries that run them. They're called bonospheres. Those are measuring cosmic radiation. Mm -hmm. But uh, I recommend you read this little information leaflet. <laughs> This is not my, uh, field of expertise. my field of expertise. We have an underwater observatory where we do water sampling. We have an atmospheric observatory. We also do a daily uh, weather balloon launch. Freshly warmed balloons. The French-German station runs one of the longest term climate studies in the Arctic, with daily measurements going back more than 25 years. These weather balloon launches are done around the world, but as it's so far north, and the only one on Spitsbergen, it's quite an important data point. And immediately after the launch, we send the data to mm -hmm. other meteorological offices, and it's used for, for weather forecasts and models. So what we do now is going to be distributed all over the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like the biggest balloon I think I've seen. So it's good conditions. It should be an easy launch. Wow, it does go fast. Now we can all track the balloon on a map. It's coming in live. This is New Alessund. It's over the fjord. Wow, that was fast. Right now. Okay. We get vertical profiles through the atmosphere for temperature, pressure, relative humidity. And what can you tell from that? And we see that per decade, on average, the temperature has increased by about uh, 1.3 degrees centigrade. In winter, it's over three degrees per decade. With the Arctic, it's warming at a rate over double the global average. 
So that's a very dramatic temperature increase. The winters are a lot less harsh. The fjord is no longer freezing over. So you can really visually see these changes. The glaciers are retreating. To see photos from the 1920s or so compared with now, you can really see that they've gone back very considerably. It's sad to see the glaciers retreat, of course. It's so rapid and so dramatic. This environment is disappearing. I'm quite scared about climate change, personally. It's still not treated as the priority that it should be. I don't see us as humans responding as rapidly as we need to. And I'm not sure where it's all going. We feel that it's part of our responsibility and to show this to the world. But climate research isn't the only science happening in Nialisund. Contamination has become another major area of study in the Arctic. Today we're going out with Oyvind Mikkelsen and his team to take water samples and samples from the sea floor to see how mercury and other heavy metals have affected the environment here. My name is Eivind Mikkelsen. I'm a professor in analytical and environmental chemistry in NTNU Trondheim. In this project we are doing here, we are looking at pollutants. Mainly we are looking at the heavy metals uh, like mercury and arsenic, copper, zinc, pollutants which is staying for a long time in the environment or are really toxic for the environment. About 50% of the mercury which is here is man-made, it is not natural. The mercury is arriving from the atmosphere, from Asia and uh, from Russia and from Europe and so on. Mostly it is from coal burning, any industry which use coal as uh, combustion. Mercury ends up in the Arctic area and it meets the cold environment and settles together with the ice and snow, which is called the atmospheric mercury depletion event. By this it is brought to the sea and it's absorbed and eaten by microorganisms which is then going up in the food web. The big problem is that they accumulate in yes. the food web. The small is eaten by the bigger, which is eaten by the even bigger animals and mm -hmm. at the end it really gets uh, to the toxic levels when it reaches the big animals like uh, polar bear and seal and also whales actually because they eat enormously amounts. In the body of animals, mercury is uh, toxic and it destroys the nervous system, so they don't eat food, and so it's uh, actually changing how the animal is acting. So this is why it's important to follow, track it, where do it come from, how do it act and react in uh, the nature. Now we are about two kilometers from the river mouse area. We will start with a water sample in one meter, and then we will take one at uh, two meter, and five meter, and ten and then we go close to the seafloor. And why do you choose those different depths? We like to make a profile to see actually how metals are distributed as a function of depths in the water. This is an e-skin bottle to take water samples from different depths. So it's a bolt system which is gliding down the wire, which is closing the sample inside the tube, so we can bring it up from a specific depth. So you're taking two different samples, a cup and a syringe. Yeah, this is for uh, elemental analysis of the heavy metals, uh, like mercury. The other one is just to know about the uh, amount of particles and the salinity, because there is a river, so we would like to see the impact of it. Okay, you try? Yes. This is for the first time she do water sampling. Um, I'm Natalia Kozak, I am from Poland. And now I will take my sample, it's only 10 milliliters. So I should filter it slow, this is why it's dropping. This is my first time in the Nielsen. <laughs> it's so wonderful. <laughs> I could see the glacier, this view, this high mountains. It's really completely different environment. Here is actually a point where you can see pure nature. Yep, and this is my sample. So I'm storing this outside because it's cold and when I'm back in the station I will put uh, some acid to conserve my sample. Okay. My name is Borgil Mo and I study uh, environmental chemistry. Svalbard is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. And it's very remote as well and different. You don't have a phone, so that's one of the most special things. Is like you're not thinking about the next Snapchat or Instagram, you're actually enjoying it. For each sample, I measure the conductivity and the turbidity of the water. I just use this instrument right here. And this is a multimeter. The conductivity just tells us something about how many charged ions we have in the water. I can see that it changes, so it's like 
the turbidity is really low at the bottom and higher, higher up. At, at, no, 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 it's just on. <laughs> yeah, I almost ran off with my sample. <laughs> One challenge is concentration levels. Because even if they end up in toxic concentrations, in the polar bear, when we monitor them in water or soil, they are really low. You have to have equipment which is uh, able to measure really low concentration. I have this other instrument here. It measures how much particles we have in the water. It sends out a little IR radiation and the particles in the water will scatter the light. And then we wait. <laughs> what is this device that you use to collect the sample? This is a grub sampler. When it comes to the sea floor, the grub will close together and grab some portion of the sediment. Yeah, that's really good one. Ah, you, it smell good. You can so, definitely yeah. smell it. Yeah. Salt, like the sulfur yeah, running. That's <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of life going cool. on in there. So this one will be freeze dried and then we will take a small portion and actually decompose it with acid in a microwave oven. And then it goes to what we call elemental analysis. Okay. So we can screen it for up to 60 elements. Like mercury and other heavy metals. I could cut it with a knife. It's really tough. And the sample is for organic material, so we can uh, analyze how much organic is in the sediment. Just in case, it's better to secure your samples because you don't want to lose anyone. We take them back to our university to analyze them for trace elements and organic matter. So we're comparing the samples from the spring and the autumn, which can tell us where the trace elements are coming from. Look at this one. Oh. <laughs> Do you try and save the we creatures? Try, we leave it back in the sea. Yeah. The project, which has been running for five years now, we start to conclude at some of the results we have. And for mercury, we see that in the topsoil, we have five times more compared to the core samples, which is far back in time. And we have this kind of transport of mercury from the atmosphere to the environment. Oyvind's research into the mechanisms of mercury transport is still ongoing but it has already brought to light some troubling findings. Despite being largely unpopulated, Svalbard has levels of surface toxins like mercury only slightly lower than populated areas on mainland Norway. Svalbard should be a really clean area with a healthy environment, but when you start to do the measurement of the toxicants, you find them here. Even medical rests, microplastics, or the heavy metals, which is produced far away from this area, the Arctic seems like this place that's untouched by man, but as we're seeing from the work being done today, it's a place where pollution and contamination is evident in the water and in the sediment. The Arctic isn't actually a habit for humans. We're not living here, but it's polluted by us. We should study it because it means if the area where we're not living usually is polluted, it means the whole planet will be soon polluted and we will just make it worse for our next generations. The rest of the world really affects the Arctic. It's a pretty important thing to study and to find out more about and to communicate to the rest of the world what's happening. Of course, to avoid it, the best would be to stop the burning of fossil fuel or industry which is producing mercury. In the big picture, what is happening one place in the world affects another place in the world. Every single scientist we spoke to had something to say about the connectedness of the water systems, about how contamination both ends up here and has a bigger impact. It really does make you see that the Arctic is connected to the rest of us. The craziest thing about spending a month in the Arctic isn't the frigid weather or the omnipresence of polar bears. It's actually adjusting to the light. And it doesn't really get into your head until you're here what like midnight sun actually means. I'm looking at a sun graph right now. You can see for this whole chunk between basically mid-May until early August, it's just constant bright daylight. And it's amazing how quickly that jumps to complete darkness all the time. We were interested in learning more about the unique phenomenon that characterized the Arctic sky. So we met up with Prahelga at the Tromsø Museum. Most areas where people live are around the belt of our own planet, which means that the sun will rise in the morning and set at night. If you're at the equator, this happens, you know, at six in the morning and at six at night. 
every day. We are now moved to the polar region, almost on top, as we revolve will be some times of the year facing the sun so much that we can always see it. And the opposite thing happens in the winter time where we are sort of leaning backwards and we happen to be on the side of the earth which is facing away from the sun. So in addition to the daily night and day routine, we also have like one huge day and one huge night and they last for an entire year. The long day period, which lasts from mid-May to the end of July, is called the midnight sun. During this period, there's 24 hours of daylight in the Arctic. It's past 11 at night. I'm about to try to go to sleep, but it's brighter in the evening than it is in the morning. It messes with you when you're about to go to bed and you're hit with like the full rays of the sun. I shouldn't be staring directly at it. <laughs> Life and all life forms has to adapt to this and be ready whenever the sun is up and the snow has thawed. It's like an explosion. The sun sets again for the first time at the end of July, but it only dips under the horizon for a few minutes and it's back up again. So we have lots of daylight and we won't actually see darkness and stars until the beginning of September. And then days are getting shorter and shorter and now the sun dips completely under the horizon. The long dark period, which lasts from late November to late January, is called the polar night. And for three months, the sun never rises. The Arctic night isn't completely black. Even around Christmas Eve, which is the darkest day of the year, we still have wonderful hues of lilac and dark blue. If there are clouds coming in, you know, they'll be pink and orange, lit up from the underside by the sun, which is below the horizon. So it's quite beautiful colors. There is always something to see in the sky here. And when it goes dark, the stars come out, then comes the northern lights. The most infamous thing about the Arctic sky is the northern lights. This elusive phenomenon is one of the main reasons people travel this far north, and we wanted to know why. Have you actually seen the aurora? No, it's such an iconic image that I associate with this part of the world. Is here the best place to see it? There are other places in the world where you can see them, of course, because the northern lights appear around our planet, let's say in a sort of belt, and the Tromsø is right underneath the middle of this belt, which means that even the weakest auroras can be seen from here. Here is our small little planet. From the sun comes heat that we can feel and light we can see, but also something called uh, the solar wind, which is a stream of particles, uh, mainly electrons. They come in towards the Earth, and then they are deflected because the Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field which is a shield that protects us from it. This uh, magnetic field doesn't look like a ball. It has this cusp over the magnetic poles. So now we get a stream of electrons coming in the other way, and they create the northern light and the southern light. So there are usually about 100 nights of aurora every year. And you know, it would be great if they come on average every Wednesday and every Saturday or something, <laughs> but they don't. They, they appear sometimes 14 days in a row and sometimes there are weeks without nothing. Anymore. Yeah, they're not on a schedule, it doesn't seem but, like. No, that's, that's right. <laughs> I mean, this is a place where you suddenly become so aware of the sun and the light. The aurora brings hundreds of thousands of travelers from around the world to the Arctic each year and inspires everything from music festivals to aurora chasing. We're headed off with Torsten to chase the northern lights and these tours can sometimes take all night, so fingers crossed we'll see how it goes. I'm Torsten Arslaksen. I'm working as a physics teacher and a northern light guide here in Tromsø. And we are out chasing the aurora. So where are we now? We are now at the uh, ASCAT facility, close okay. to Tromsø. This is a place where we do uh, science for checking out how the upper atmosphere is. Based on your sense of doing this for so long, what do you think our chances are tonight? That's the nice thing about nature. You don't know what to expect. <laughs> so we could have a nice aurora tonight, but we could also have no aurora. Oh, okay, so we'll keep hunting for now. Yes, <laughs> we have to. All right. Yeah. We have this little machine called the Terella. It is based on Professor Birkeland's experiment from 1913. He was so keen to study the aurora that he had to bring the aurora into the laboratory. He built a big box. He pumped out nearly all the air 
and inside is a ball made of brass. He fitted it with a magnet and then by running an electric current through this box he could create auroras around his miniature planet. It's really making genuine auroras in a miniature uh, outer space system. He, he recreated the Earth. Push the button and hold it in. So you actually see the electrons moving from the sun over towards the You can see the patterns of the Antarctic lights as well as the northern lights here at yes. the same time. And you'll never be able to have northern lights without the southern lights at the same time. They always happen at the same time and they are quite exact mirror images of each other. So this is a warm suit. Okay. It's a way to survive in the winter during cold nights. All right. But you think this is warm now, whereas I think this is freezing. Well, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's warm. I wouldn't jump into the sea, uh, but uh, it's not winter yet. <laughs> I like this suit. Okay. Our eyes are special. They are sensitive to light, uh, some of the cells, but they can't distinguish between colors. Mm -hmm. And that's why we say in Norway that in the night, all cats are gray, because <laughs> it's too little light in order to see it. So if I just take like this, Okay. Cameras don't have brains that play tricks on you when you hope to be seeing the aurora. Well, the camera just tells you the truth. You have something that's called white balance. And sometimes <laughs> white ba balance uh, can trick you out. Yes. Uh, and I can't see anything. Hmm. There's an amazing clarity when you're trying to look at stars, though. Yes. And these stars in the Big Dipper, they point towards the northern star, Polaris. Mm -hmm. If you were on the North Pole, that star would be pointing directly up. So the angle you have between directly it's up... pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty close. <laughs> as close as I've seen it. Ever. Yes, yeah, we got 20 degrees from it the... Means we're uh, pretty north, north yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's so cold, I want to be sick. <laughs> it's so cold. Well, I plan to go over to uh, some huts over there to heat up a little bit. Okay. Which is used by the scientific staff when they are here. Uh, I used to know the cold some years ago, and uh, <laughs> they still might have the same cold. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Mm-hmm, that didn't work. That was not a cold. Yes. Just breaking into some scientific facilities. <laughs> Hello. So do people stay here? Yes. Okay. So I'll go over and pick up the gear and you can just sit Wait there here? and enjoy the warm... Okay. Uh, yeah. So I'll be back in 15 minutes. We're just seeking shelter temporarily and Torsten has the hookups to all the kind of researcher cabins and stuff around here. So we're now in this very, very, very comfy cabiny lounge and it's almost too comfortable for me. Poised AF, <laughs> that's what we call this angle. The earth has a big magnet inside put it simply, um, and the north tip of that one is not located at the same point as the geographic pole, it's, it's tilted a little bit. It also actually, the magnetic pole moves, but very slowly, but over the centuries and millennia it's moving quite a bit. It does affect where you can see the aurora, because the aurora always has its center in the magnetic field. So that's why, for instance, if we go back 500 years, it was possible to see great auroras over Central Europe, over Germany, France, England. There's records of that? Yeah, there are. Some of them are really quite fun. Um, uh, in the southern parts of England, people saw a great aurora over the English Channel. And when the aurora appears at those southern latitudes, it's always red. So they Ooh. thought it was a fire somewhere, or they were really scared and you know, they ran to <laughs> seek shelter until some bright head said, I know what it is. It's France burning up. <laughs> it's <laughs> always the French. They were at war with France and they went to their trips and said uh, great thanks to the good Lord who had eradicated France. And you know what I mean? Imagine their disappointment the next day when France was still there. <laughs> Hot drinks and Norwegian lefse. Very nice. Seems like there were some people here staying here before us. Yes. <laughs> he has good taste in a uh, whiskey there. Yes. <laughs> Come sit down. No problem. <laughs> I mean, the stakes are that we get thrown back out into the cold. Hello, I'm just with a film team to show them the aurora. I used to work here, so we have access to this area. Only so you know that we are not thieves. Uh. 
Is he okay? I didn't know him from before, so I had to take a lengthy explanation, but we will only stay here for a short while. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, get a little bit heated, get the clothes on, and then go out again. We'll keep it moving. Mm. <laughs> okay, let's go out in the cold. Yes, let's go chase the aurora some more. Yeah. To get the most of the aurora, you need to go to a dark place. So let's see what's in this direction. Nothing. Looks like a road that continues into infinity, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. I think we could be in this spot. Okay, now you have to take the light away or it will destroy the... You see oh, that? Oh, I can see it. Yes. <laughs> I can see the beginnings of it. Yeah. This is so cool. Can I take another image? Oh, <gasps> wow. Okay, that was a good one. Yeah. So I'm starting to see it with my naked eye yes. just now, but why is it so much stronger with the camera? Well, the camera can take a longer exposure than your eye is uh, capable of, of doing. Okay. And the other thing is that uh, the pixels in the camera are more sensitive. They count more of the photons that actually are there than your cells in your eye. Got it. So if you take another one, let's see how it is now. Oh, yeah. wow, yeah. It's kind of got two get, bands now. Yeah, it's two bands, which is a good sign because that's a typical thing that happens before we have an aurora outbreak. You start to wonder if your mind is playing tricks on you because something will just emerge out of nowhere and then you're thinking, yeah. am I just yeah. seeing things? Yeah, we got some more action. Yeah, yeah and it's moving so quickly and yeah. just changing yeah. shapes so much. Yeah. And it can go, go even stronger. In five minutes, it can be flashing all over the sky. Ooh, look at that. And it just moves, it completely shape shifts. It's such a huge display of lights in the sky. It's really impressive. People had all sorts of beliefs and there was superstition about the aurora. It was said that you have to cover your hair if you go out under the aurora, lest it be burnt and scolded. There were things you couldn't do when the aurora was out. For instance, you shouldn't be cutting anything or using metal. Both the Sami and in several places of Norway, people believe that it were the spirits of your ancestors. In the western coast of Norway, they talked about how the Northern Lights are formed by the spirits of maidens waving their beautifully knitted mittens to attract suitors up there in the sky. After midnight, the aurora tends to be more over the whole sky. It's always more magnificent when you see it directly up because it will show as a corona. It looks like it comes from one point. Like this. That's crazy. That was so bright and it just flared yes. up out of nowhere. And you can see how it, it's oh, like wow. an arc that goes there. It's taking over the sky. Like Everything's it. going off now. <laughs> someone working over there, someone yeah. working over there. You can't be looking in one direction. You have to mm -hmm. <laughs> turn your head on. I can see like massive glowing patches that just suddenly emerge and then just streaks will suddenly just start swirling yeah. up. And it can change in seconds actually. Yeah. Let wow. me take a time lapse of this. Look at that. Sometimes when you have a mix of energies and they will reach to an area where they find nitrogen molecules, they shine with this purple color. The one with curtains and rays associated with high energy electron after there has been a magnetic explosion there. And then they dance. This is not the normal sky I'm yeah. used to. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Holy sh**. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. I feel insanely lucky to have seen this. Like, I've never seen the sky glowing like this. Yeah. Seeing the Northern Lights in person was breathtaking. You see the pictures, and it surpassed my expectations. They really do dance. It's really beautiful. That was pretty special. Soft. I don't even think I can get into this like gracefully. Oh my god. <laughs> I got trapped. I think this looks great. I'm like a wildling. 